Good morning, I'm Giulia Zamboni and we will now discuss acute and chronic splenic diseases. The learning objectives for this talk are to describe the most common causes of acute and chronic splenic disease, excluding malignant lesions, and to define imaging protocols, including functional and metabolic techniques, to apply for the detection and characterization. But let's take one step back and see how the spleen appears on regular imaging. On ultrasound, the spleen has a homogeneous parenchyma, and its echogenicity is in between that of the pancreas and of the liver and kidney. On non-contrast CT, the ultrasound is hypotenuating to the liver and has a density between 40 and 60 Hounsfield units. After contrast administration, in the arterial phase it shows a mottled serpentine enhancement pattern and in the equilibrium phase it appears homogeneous. On MRI, the signal intensity on T1-weighted images is iso-intense iso to the muscle and on T2-weighted images it's hyper-intense to the liver. On diffusion-weighted imaging, the spleen is characteristically the, most, uh, the brightest abdominal organ because it has the most restricted diffusion. After contrast administration, we see the same enhancement pattern as for CT, with the mottled enhancement pattern on the arterial phase and a homogeneous enhancement in the venous and equilibrium phases. Nuclear medicine uses different tracers and we can use technetium T99 which accumulates in the liver and in the spleen and it's used commonly to localize splenic tissues, typically intrapancreatic accessory spleens. FTG is normally uh, uptaken little by the normal spleen and has lower FTG uptake than uh, the liver. But this, this uptake can uh, increase after the patient takes some medications, for example GTSF. Now moving on to the first learning objective of this talk, we're going to describe the most common acute, uh, causes of acute and chronic diseases. Now the spleen can be interested by a variety of different diseases, but in the interest of time we're going to focus only on benign mass lesions, some diffuse infiltrative processes and some other abnormalities. The most common benign splenic lesion is a splenic cyst, which is usually an asymptomatic incidental finding, most commonly it's solitary. And if we exclude the parasitic cysts, we can distinguish two categories, true cysts, which have an epithelial lining, and false cysts, which actually have a fibrous wall. On CT, cysts are going to be hypotenuating. On MRI, they're going to be hypointense on T1-weighted images and hyperintense on T2-weighted images. The wall is going to have a low signal intensity if there are calcifications or if there's a presence of hemosiderin. And cysts typically show no enhancement, as we can see in this case of a large unilocular cyst, and in this other case where we can see a multiloculated cyst with various uh, content in the different loculations because of different protein content, and we can see some slight enhancement of, uh, the, um, of the septa of this cyst. The most common splenic neoplasm is splenic hemangioma, which is observed in up to 14% of autopsies, and it's a proliferation of vascular channels lined by epithelium and filled by blood. These lesions are non-capsulated and are again an incidental finding. They can be solitary or multiple, they have well-defined margins, usually they are small, less than 2 cm, and they will show a marked enhancement. On MRI, they're going to be hypo to iso intense on T1-weighted imaging, and they can show susceptibility if there are calcifications. Typically, hemangiomas are going to be hyperintense on T2-weighted images. And after contrast administration, the enhancement patterns can be different. We can have an immediate homogeneous and persistent enhancement. We can have an early peripheral enhancement with a uniform delayed enhancement. And we can have a peripheral enhancement with a fill in and then a delayed enhancement of a central fibrous scar. What is interesting and must be noted is that the peripheral enhancement is ring-like and not nodular as we are used to see with the liver hemangiomas, and this because of inherent differences in parenchymal vascularizations between the spleen and the liver. So here we can see one example of a peripheral ring enhancement followed by fill-in of the lesion. And these same patterns of enhancement we can see also in CT. For example, here we can see immediate homogeneous enhancement which is then persistent, and in this other case, we can see the peripheral ring enhancement followed by fill-in and still a delayed enhancement of the central scar. 
Splenic lymph angioma is commonly seen in children and is due to a dilation of uh, uh, small lymphatic channels which form thin walled cysts. They are typically subcapsular and there may be satellite lesions. These lesions usually have internal uh, very thin septations and they can show peripheral calcifications. As we can see in this example, we can see a subcapsular lesion, thin walls that do not enhance, and this is the typical location and appearance of lymphangiomas in CT. At MRI, lymphangiomas are going to be hypo-intense on T1-weighted images. They can be hyper-intense if there is a protein or a hemorrhagic content. On T2-weighted images, they're going to be hyper-intense, and we can better appreciate the multi-locations. The septa are hypo-intense and can show some enhancement after contrast administration. Hamartoma is a solid, well-defined, round lesion. It can appear mildly hypo-intense to iso-intense on T1-weighted images, and on T2-weighted images it's going to be heterogeneous, slightly to moderately hyper-intense. After contrast administration, there is intense and homogeneous or heterogeneous enhancement in the arterial phase, and the lesion remains iso-intense to slightly hyper-intense in the delayed phase. Another similar lesion is inflammatory pseudotumor, which is an uncommon benign entity with a debated etiology. Some authors have co correlated with uh, um, EBV infection, and it's usually an incidental finding. These are large lesions, 3 to 20 centimeters, mostly described above 10 centimeters. And at CT, we can see a well circumscribed solitary low attenuation mass that may or may not show calcifications. And after contrast administration, the lesion appears hypovascular with a progressive delayed enhancement. At MRI, the lesion is going to be hypo to iso intense on T1-weighted images. It can have variable appearance on T2-weighted imaging. And then again, after contrast administration, the lesion can be hypovascular or even hypervascular, so we have a varied appearance. Sclerosing angiomatoid nodular transformation, better known as SANT, is a rare benign vascular disorder described only about 10 years ago. In the first reports, it appeared to have a high a female prevalence, but now as the number of cases described is increasing, we see that the gender difference is evening out. These are large lesions that in half of the cases are diagnosed because they cause abdominal pain, pancetopenia, and splenomegaly. And the splenectomy is the complete cure for this disease. It's a vascular mass made of multiple angiomatoid nodules with a dense fibrous stroma. And these fibrous bands coalesce to form a central stellate uh, fibrous scar. On imaging, these appear as well circumscribed around solitary masses, which can be uh, mistaken for sclerosed hemangiomas or inflammatory pseudotumors. At CT, in the non-contrast scan, they will appear homogeneous and iso to hypoattenuating, and after contrast administration, they're going to be hypoenhancing and heterogeneous. At MRI, they're going to be iso intense on a T-weighted imaging, except for uh, areas where we can have presence of hemorrhage. On T2-weighted imaging, they're typically heterogeneous and predominantly hypo-intense, except for some hyper-intense radiations that we can see moving from the periphery towards the center. After contrast administration, we can have early peripheral radiating lines or a rim enhancement, and we have a progressive enhancement. And sometimes we can also see a spoke wheel pattern of enhancement. Up to 20% of the lesions are going to show a central scar, which may not enhance on the delayed images. And here we can very nicely see an example of enhancement with the lesion that is hypo-intense and then has radiating bands of enhancement from the periphery to the center of the lesion and is hyper-intense on the delayed phases. Pyogenic abscess is a rare lesion in the, screen, in the spleen, describing up to 1% of the population, and it's often unrecognized clinically. It can have various etiology, infection, trauma, infarct, and immunodeficiency being the most common. It, shows, um, it appears as a non-enhancing lesion or a lesion that shows peripheral irregular rim enhancement. On T1-weighted imaging, it's going to be hypo-intense. On T2-weighted imaging, it's going to be hyper-intense. And it's often accompanied by perisplenic fluid. 
And we can see here an example of a 37-year-old male patient with co-infection by HIV and HCV. And here we can see a large splenic abscess by, uh, is caused by Ischiarichia coli. We see a large hypotenuating fluid lesion with peripheral wall, enhancing wall, and this was a large um, splenic abscess. The infectious agents responsible of uh, um, infections of the spleen are different immunocompetent and immunodepressed patients. In immunocompetent patients, we have viral infections, we have parasitic infection, and we have granulomatous infections. And here we can see a case of an enlarged spleen with multiple pseudoaneurysms caused by a babesiosis. Immunocompromised patients, for example, patients with leukemia or after bone marrow transplantations or patients affected by AIDS, are most commonly prone to fungal infections, typically Candida, Cryptococcus, and Aspergillus. And in this case, we have a small multiple discrete abscesses, which are better seen with MRI compared to CT. And these lesions may not enhance in the acute phase, so it must not be mistaken for other kinds of lesion. And here we can see an example of a young patient with leukemia who had liver and splenic abscesses from Candida albicans. After these infections resolved, some of them may calcify, typically those who cause uh, small granulomas, like in this case of pseumocystosis. Sickle cell disease is an inherited hemoglobinopathy, which uh, may um, present with splenomegaly, splenic infarctions, and the um, sum up of these splenic infarctions may lead to what is called otosplenectomy, where the spleen is small, dense, and calcified. Patients with sickle cell disease undergo repeat transfusions and therefore may have problems of iron deposition. And when we have iron deposition, the spleen is going to appear hypointense on T1-weighted images and show susceptibility artifacts on T2-weighted imaging. As we see in all cases of hemosiderosis, where we have iron accumulation in the reticuloendothelial system, the spleen is going to be hyperdense on, on non-contrast CT, hypointense on T1-weighted imaging, and hypointense again on T2-weighted imaging. Portal hypertension induces a passive congestion of the spleen, which results in splenomegaly and the presence of several venous collaterals. In the splenic parenchyma, we can also appreciate small multifocal intrasplenic hemorrhages, and we can have the so-called gamma candy bodies. These are seen in up to 12% of the patient with portal hypertension and are made of hemosiderin, fibrous tissue, and calcium. And they can also show coarse calcifications. On uh, MR weighted image, on MR, these are going to appear like multiple uh, low signal intensity foci, which show blooming on T2 images. And we can see here the large spleen with many small calcified nodules, which appear hypointense on all, um, on all MR sequences. Sarcoidosis is a multisystem disease presenting with non caseating granuloma. We have at cross sectional imaging both CT and MRI, we can see hepatosplenomegaly, we can see lymphadenopathies. And these granulomas are going to be hypodense on CT. These lesions are typically small, less than one centimeter. They're usually multiple. And they're going to appear hypointense both on T1 and T2 weighted imaging on MR. Contrast CT and uh, um, contrast enhanced MRI are going to show us a minimal delay of these lesions, which is usually uh, a minimal enhancement of these lesions, which is usually delayed. And other types of granulomatous diseases can be seen, especially in rheumatologic patients, as we can see in these patients affected by um, rheumatoid arthritis, where we can see on ultrasound several uh, hypoechoic uh, nodules, which appear well enhancing on a post-contrast CT and appear to be isointense on uh, MRI and uh, enhance with a persistent enhancement after contrast administration. Splenic infarction is due to the obstruction of the splenic artery or its branches. It can be due to the presence of cardiac emboli or to local thrombosis, which can be caused by vasculitis, hematologic disorders, or um, leukemia, lymphoma, and other uh, malignant diseases. On ultrasound, we can see some wedge-shaped peripheral areas of uh, 
coarsen the echo texture, which can be hypoechoic or hyperechoic depending on the age of the effect. And what we can typically see is the lack of vascularity at color Doppler imaging. After contrast agent administration at cross-sectional imaging, we can better appreciate this wedge-shaped area typically subcapsular in distribution of non-enhancing parenchyma, and we can have some peripheral enhancement due to a collateral flow from the vessels of the capsula. On T1-weighted imaging, these lesions have variable appearance depending on the presence and the age of the hemorrhage, and on T2-weighted imaging, they are typically hyperintense. Moving on to the second learning objective of our talk, defining imaging protocols function with functional and metabolic techniques to apply for the detection and characterization of splenic diseases. But are we really talking about detection and characterization? Splenic lesions, as we discussed previously, are most often an incidental finding. So it seldom happens that we are looking for some lesion in the spleen. And the imaging has more a role in the detection, especially for patients with left upper quadrant pain or patients with signs and symptoms of infection without an unknown uh, um, origin or patients with trauma. And the protocols, the imaging protocols for all these uh, um, uh, scenarios are well defined. So, what do we have to bear in mind when we are evaluating the spleen? There are, there's a list of things that we have to assess. We have to assess the number and the location of the spleen or spleens. We have to assess its size. We have to assess the echogenicity, density or intensity of the parenchyma. We have to evaluate its enhancement and we have to see if there are mass lesions and in that case if there's only one of the, if there are multiple lesions. Starting with the number of the spleens, we can have no spleen at all in what is called asplenia, which is often uh, um, correlated with situs abnormalities, or we have an increased number of spleens. And this happens most commonly with accessory spleens, but we also can have splenosis with several spleens in the left upper quadrant, and we can have polysplenia. Moving to the size of the spleen, the spleen can be enlarged, typically in portal hypertension, but also in hematologic diseases, primary tumors, infection and storage diseases. Or the spleen can be small, as we have uh, listened for sickle cell disease, post-infarction or post-radiation therapy. Moving to the evaluation of the parenchyma, we have to evaluate the density or intensity of the parenchyma, of the splenic parenchyma for the evaluation of diffuse diseases and we can assess its enhancement for uh, the presence of infarction. Focal lesions are not going to be the object of the, this talk, but of other talks. So to round up, the spleen is often a forgotten organ, even for radiologists who focus on abdominal imaging. And it can be involved by a wide range of benign and malignant processes. Splenic lesions, splenic diseases are often incidental findings. And imaging can be helpful in the detection, but only seldom we have specific features that enable us to accurately characterize this lesion. And the clinical context is always important and helpful for uh, obtaining a final diagnosis. Thank you for your attention.